Well, let's go ahead and get started. If the board is able, we'll jump to the. Um, we do have one change on there that we'll be doing, and this may or may not be on your agenda. We've got some take home messages that we want to send you all with. Um, suggestion by our vice chair, which I think is phenomenal, that we have an action item. Um, so that we are moving forward and, and taking this back to our councils. Um, so, so okay, I think we'll jump to number three until we get our full quorum here. So Eric, you don't mind starting reports? Not at all. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you everyone from my side as well for being here. This is great. Uh, the lake, as you might all know, might, like most of the lakes in the, in the state, are looking really, really well. Uh, Utah Lake is just 0.59 feet below full. It hasn't been here since 2011, I think. Maybe 2015 got close. Uh, this photo is from one of our uh, Lakeshore residents in Vineyard. Normally, the Phragmites that you see going out quite a long ways uh, is just dense vegetation out in front of their property. Uh, and right now the lakeshore has come in, he says, 250 feet towards his house, so he's going to install a diving board. Uh, so let's make sure we get everything. So um, the grants, uh, we'll talk about this momentarily, but on the budget that we have uh, in our public hearing today, uh, one of the items that we talked about last time is a uh, a shoreline improvements grant. Uh, what we're hoping for is we have all of these projects that have been, and this is just a, a couple that I grabbed, but we have all these projects that have been planned around Utah Lake uh, that have yet to be funded. Uh, so we have awesome plans, really, really uh, access point improvements that, that I think would make a big difference uh, for visitation on the lake, uh, but we've just yet to find the funding for those. Uh, we have been working, uh, we had a discussion about two governing board meetings ago where we broke up and, and talked about funding alternatives for uh, Utah Lake improvements. And the county, we, we kind of took all of those and worked, explored them for viability, and the county has taken some initiative on that and is interested in uh, pulling together some funding and kind of earmarking it for Utah Lake projects. Not necessarily funding them on their own, uh, but setting aside a portion of their budget to potentially go towards these as uh, communities are express interest in, and have dollars of their own to kind of put in towards those projects. So uh, if you uh, have chance to uh, work with the county uh, as those as that uh, budget is is brought before uh, the communities that that work with the county. It would be awesome to get your support on on the potential for the, for an earmark, whether that be on their transient room tax or their tourism tax. Um, it's unclear where they would be pulling that, but that would be really uh, great to have support as they move ahead with that. So just for shoreline improvements is what we're asking. It would be Lake Utah Lake improvements. Okay. So for many of those would be shoreline and access improvements, but some of those could be improving water quality. Um, okay, so the grants that we talked about last time, the WRI and the UDAF, what were those grants specifically for? Those two are specifically for invasive uh, and shoreline restoration. So okay. removing Phragmites, removing Russian olive and uh, tamarisk. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of preps the shoreline for restoration of, of our natural areas. Uh, but bringing in sand on our on our sandy beaches that have kind of diminished in quality over the years, uh, or adding facilities at some of our marinas, that's those are the type of projects uh, that this grant and the the county um, assistance uh, would come in to play for. Uh, yeah, those those two in specific. So the ISM the recovery, are in, one for improvement. Or two for recovery, a new one for improvement. Yeah, and those two are very specific. I mean, the Watershed Restoration Initiative is very specific in what it will and won't fund. 
and then the Invasive Species Mitigation Fund, even more so, it's very, very strict on, on the types of projects it can do, so it wouldn't necessarily be a beach, but we could right. qualify in that regard. So. Okay. Uh, the Phragmites treatments uh, so far this year um, have gone fairly well. Uh, we were able to get the north end of the lake largely smashed. All of it last fall was, was treated chemically. Uh, the marsh masters were phenomenal. Uh, we had a, uh, an issue with the mowers on them. Uh, there was a, a drive connection that, that allowed those mowers to work and it was breaking. And we finally found a local machine shop that specializes in that specific kind of thing and they've, they're building a couple that they say will last as long as the machines last instead of the last one we, the last two we purchased lasted about a couple hours each. And so uh, we think that in the next couple days we'll have those and, uh, and they can get out both machines running and working nonstop so that we have most of it smashed down in preparation for this fall's uh, treatment again. Uh, Wakara Way, I think everyone here has heard of Wakara Way. This is the project west of, well, I guess south of Vineyard, west of Morham, west of Provo. It, it, it's this wetland area, the Powell Slough is part of that, uh, that, that is being worked on to uh, add a grazing element to that, get shoreline trail uh, delineated through there, and uh, we've been working with the landowners, with the communities that are in the area, and kind of developing that plan so that we can have a, a master agreement in place that allows Wakara Way, which would be a 501c3, manage the area, and that all of the all of the land managers and landowners in the area would would provide a grazing easement and a, and a trail easement or a trail transfer, I guess, since it would be a permanent trail. Uh, we've had great meetings. Uh, the, the last um, entity or manager that we had to meet with was Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, we met with their uh, lands manager, and they were great to work with. They're willing to partner on this. Uh, they would issue a, a permit for grazing instead of a, a permanent one, but it's, they, they can issue them as long as 50 years. Uh, with the option to renew, so that's more than we need. Uh, we've got the, f the trail, or sorry, the, the mapping is being done by a Vineyard City uh, Planning Commission member, a, a local architect, uh, Jeff Knighton, and this is what it looks like at this point. So it just kind of comes up to the proposed Pope River Delta project, which we'll hear about later today, uh, and then develops kind of a natural <laughs> open space park uh, for all to use uh, on this approximately thousand acre piece. Uh, we're working with the Division of Wildlife on, they, they have a land specialist that will help us draft up that master agreement, and uh, it's progressing. We're excited. Uh, what I wanted to mention here is that we have one of the big problems in the area is that for 30 years it has not been grazed and the fences uh, with our smashing efforts have disappeared over the years because once, once it gets inundated with fragmites you don't see what, what's there and so the fences have been rolled down. Uh, so we're uh, in the process of getting funding to fence these areas so that they can be grazed again and we were able to get the tail end of the Tiffany Bow Conservation District budget this year. Uh, they approved that a few weeks ago. And then the Alpine Conservation District uh, has expressed informally that they're willing to do the same, but uh, they were not able to meet with their uh, board uh, earlier this week. And so that meeting has been postponed a little bit. But we expect that we'll get the, the remainder from that budget as well. So we'll probably have approximately 10,000 to get our, our uh, pilot study up and running with, with uh, about a 
60 acre parcel of things too. So. This is cattle raising, right? Not, not anything else. Just cattle. Uh, and so the, the idea, uh, Forestry Fire and State Land has been working with us on a grazing plan uh, so that we can get in there and, and graze different sections at different levels. So towards the south end of the project, we want it to be much more uh, bird habitat. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then towards the north end, it would be more the kind of an open parkish feel with, with lower grasses and that type of thing. So, um, we're excited about it. Any questions on the on the Walk Hare Way project? I thought the field trip was excellent. Oh, awesome. I agree. <coughs> Uh, we wanted to get an uh, update on the, the Vineyard Beach uh, from Councilman Flake. Uh, is a project that we're following and supporting and excited about. Thank you. Uh, there's our layout. There have been some changes since our initial discussion of it, but basically, to go back, we, after a presentation here last year uh, by a gentleman about more access to the lake, by non-powered items. Uh, working with our city planner, I proposed that we push really hard for the state recreation grant. So we came up with a plan of improving the original beach park as built by the county some years back, which has gone into decline, generally speaking. And so we uh, put a package together, we submitted and we won that grant. And then we looked at it and thought, gee, maybe we should do better. Since we were going through a general plan update in the city, we incorporated in our general plan a plan for the length of the lake within the city boundaries. And we have come up with that general plan, finalized it last week, which begins approximately just south of what today is the Lynn and Boat Harbor, the cooling ponds there left by the, the old steel plant. And then all the way down to where you saw the beginning of Walk Here Away, we've been working this quite closely for a long time. Uh, there will be four major access points along the lake, so the public can have access to the lake and use it. And this is the first one in the north. So we are proposing that parking lot that you see there in the gray, and then a driveway, if you look to the left, it just comes right off the road comes down to the beach level where there's a turnaround where they can offload their non-powered vehicles. Thank you. And then improve the, what sand is left there from years past. Put in a uh, prefab bathroom with full water facilities and also water availability outside it. And then improve the uh, shelters and tables that have fallen into disrepair. And then you can see the proposed boardwalk that runs along the upland part of that area to a grove of cottonwood trees that is presently there. Just south of the end of this picture is the beginning of what we call our promenade that runs to the center of our downtown. And there'll be approximately a 17 to 20 acre swath there that will be improved by the city with facilities. Proposed is an amphitheater, a uh, covered gathering area slash skating rink in the, the winter. And south of that, it goes down to another beach park <coughs> that's being built by one of our developers. And then the trail needs to cross a, the old canal irrigation system discharge, which is to the south. Which We've negotiated with our developer to build that bridge. And then the trail will go down along the lake again until approximately, hopefully, Center Street. And there's the major propositions. Uh, benches along the trail, there will be a trail above, a trail below, we envision. Uh, large, semi-large, green areas for people to enjoy. We propose plannings and all the, this to go with our developers. We've worked out what that's to look like. 
And I was sort of getting that to happen. <laughs> if you've worked with developers, not that mean, but just reality. <laughs> um, it, it's fabulous. It's going to be really nice. It's going to take years to accomplish, of course. We are going to bid this project in September. So we have the engineering plans almost complete for all the improvements. Uh, we'll bid in September when the push for all the current projects is over. And hopefully get that accomplished over the winter and being ready for next spring for actual use. Uh, the joy of the large increase in surface area of the lake has been we now know exactly where the uplands are <laughs> along that whole swath of the lake. Previously, we were going to have our assistant engineer walk out there in his hip boots and establish where that all was. Well, we know now where that is. So the layout of the trail has been much easier to accomplish than it was. So uh, we're excited. We look at the, the lakeside as one of our major benefits in the landmass that we inherited. And we want to develop it. Yes. What is the total length of the trail once it's completed? The trail now runs from approximately oh, 300 south to now about 200 north, and then it stops. Flagship is going to develop another one mile section in the next two months, which will take us to 400 north. Then we have to build a bridge across the canal. Then our next developer has told us next summer they will build another three miles, which will take us to this part, which should give us then approximately six miles of trail. So within the next year, you'll have six miles. Yeah. You know how projected time lines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, Walk Air Away in the south will do their part, extending it down towards Orem and Provo, which will be gorgeous if you, if you went on the field trip, you know how pretty it is out there. And the stands of trees that it will walk through, etc. We hope to be able to connect to the Linden Trail and everything within our control for the next two and a half years. So I know that the, the skating rink idea is a really good one. Uh, Linden Boat Harbor has tried it multiple years and on the rare occasion that they get the right weather conditions, it has been packed. And so if your ice rink has coolers in it, yeah. then it'll be a huge hit. Originally there was a, uh, what should we say, a mini lagoon. It was in Geneva, quote unquote, on the lake in the 1910s to 30s. And we have a picture of their original dance hall, which is really kind of cool. And Jeff, the architect of the previously saw, has drawn up what our skating rink would be, patterned on that old building. And it would be facilitated by, there's multiple arches all along the outer edge of this building. And we designed that back into it so that that would be closable so that we could close it during the winter and incorporate within that concrete slab the chilling equipment. So summertime it would be a multiple use facility, in the wintertime it would be an ice skating rink. If it's really, really bad weather we could close it, otherwise we could open it. Um, it will of course be towards the end of that development period because that's the cost we have to bear. None of our developers were really excited about doing that. <laughs> Of course. So, yeah, there's some cool things coming. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, the RFP for algae bloom treatments. Um, uh, this has been, uh, we're kind of a ways through the process. The RFP went out through state purchasing. We received uh, 11 actual bids. We had an extra one that didn't have anything. Uh, so there's 11, 11 proposals for, to be reviewed. Uh, we issued the opportunity to review that to our technical committee, and we have 
uh, someone from the technical, technical <coughs> committee that's participating from the county stormwater, and uh, Jim Harris, and Ben Holcomb from Division of Water Quality, and, I, and someone from the Division of uh, Wildlife Resources. And so they will be reviewing that. We're hoping to have those reviews done by next week. Uh, and then we can move ahead with any permits and or contracting uh, to get those done. Those will be two or three of our marinas will get the treatment that, that has been proposed uh, for the duration of this summer uh, so that hopefully you know, we can select a couple of our more popular access points and keep those algae free for the remainder of the summer and, and as long as those technologies work. Uh, that could lead to potentially something that we uh, have available to deploy at, at future dates if, if we have a bad bloom season and can take care of hot spots, if you will. I have a question on that. Yeah. Um, so I, I looked over those web proposals for you know, that, that process. We will only choose one and then we will implement that on two or three sites, or are we going to choose um, multiple? to be used at, at different sites? A ladder. So the idea is that we get a chance to to pilot a couple different technologies okay. to figure out which one is not only effective, but also uh, cost efficient as well. So. Okay. Uh, we worked on, I don't even know if we attached it. I, I think it would be probably easier to, to send it to you. Uh, so I, I kind of finalized the draft of the vision document and then forgot to provide it to everyone. Uh, so I will send that out to the group. Uh, I think it would be easier for you to review it on your own time um, so that you could kind of read through it and, and provide feedback. Uh, but right now it's about three pages, but half of that is a SWOT analysis of uh, the Lake Commission and then another one of the uh, uh, lake itself, so kind of thinking from two different perspectives, one of, of the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats of the lake itself and one for ourselves as an entity. Uh, so please review that, take some time and kind of dig through that. That that document will be a great help to our staff in focusing our efforts. There's, there's really a, an endless number of opportunities on what we could do specifically to work on Utah Lake and focusing in on those that are most important to this body is, is really helpful to us. So um, don't be afraid to add stuff that seems you know, personal to you. We're, we're very interested in making these, making uh, strides in what matters most. So I'll send that out uh, today so that you have that and we can um, bring red line um, items back that you submit over the next couple months. Uh, we'll discuss those at our next meeting. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we will jump back at now that we have a quorum. Um, just a reminder for those who haven't received their pictures yet, please take your beautiful photographs and uh, get those displayed in your city. And we will jump to our action items now. Um, we've got our governing board minutes from March 21st. Any issues, anything needs to be brought up? Okay. Not all except the motion. Okay. And that's when we want. Okay, for a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. Mon monthly financial reports, Eric. Okay, so we have February, March, April, and May uh, financial reports. Uh, nothing out of the ordinary on these. We, we're maintaining within our budget well. Uh, you notice that May has. Two, full, two pages, uh, we, we do a lot of expenditures in the month of May because we, we're finishing up our fourth grade field trips and we have our uh, Utah Lake Festival. And so that's just a big, a big month for kind of adding all of those projects in and, and running expenses on those. Uh, but otherwise, uh, if you look at the end of May's, the back page, <coughs> uh, our budget items are, we We've zeroed out one or two things like our publication memberships and we've adjusted that in our proposed budget for next year. Uh, but otherwise we're, we're within, we're 25% of our budget right now. 
uh, with just a little bit more than a year. So. Any questions on the plans? Mm -hmm. Second. 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 Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have our proposed budget for fiscal year 2020. Eric, do you want to introduce that and then we'll open the public hearing? Yeah. So, uh, the proposed budget is for a total of $297,189. Uh, we have 2% adjustments, 2.2 and 2% for wages and taxes and benefits. Uh, we bumped our publication memberships uh, 20% just to kind of adjust for, uh, we've, we've made an effort to, as a way of networking for the commission, we've uh, tied into some of the organizations uh, that allow us to get out into the community. So the recreation community, Sam uh, has a membership now with PURPA, uh, and then we try to get out to, and that's the Central Utah Recreation and Parks Association chapter. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and, and this is a great, has been a great opportunity to get out and, and really kind of work with the recreation community, get ideas on, on what we could do down at the lake and, kind of slowly push folks to uh, exploring the idea of programming uh, down at the lake as well. So we continue with those, uh, but that's what allows us to do that. Uh, other adjustments, meaningful ones, uh, down towards the end of the list, you'll see that we, we sort of adjust, we adjusted the promotion and event sponsorship. We don't do, we find that we don't do nearly as many event sponsorships as we do promotion. And so we simply just took about 20% of the event sponsorship and put it into the promotion budget. So not a huge change there, just kind of an adjustment. And then we added a little bit this year to invasive species control. So that's our general budget, our general fund budget. The next page is our capital projects fund. Uh, we will add 9,000 of our from our general fund to that budget this year. Uh, and then as far as expenditures, uh, there are three larger expenditures that we are planning for this upcoming year or proposing. Uh, the first uh, under equipment purchase, which is the bottom right of the, of the document, 30,000. This is to, uh, and we proposed, we, we brought this up in our tentative budget, but this is to purchase a, it's called a forestry tool, and that attaches onto the county's uh, skid steer. It allows us to go down into these areas that are invaded with Russian olive and tamarisk, or salt cedars, and just mow down those trees, and then you treat it chemically, and you can move through an area, and we have quite a few of them on the lake, uh, but you can move through rapidly, and it's much more effective than uh, trying to get a hand crew in with chainsaws attempting to cut through, especially salt cedars, which can be just like trying to chainsaw through wire. Uh, they're just messy and, and thick. So we're excited about using that. The county upgraded their skid steer this year, and so they're now ready to have this new machine. So uh, we'll work with them on, on purchasing for that with their motor pool. Uh, it'll belong to them, and they'll they'll use that for uh, lake projects, so we're excited about that one. Uh, the Shoreline Soils Assessment, uh, this is a, an assessment around the lake shore uh, that we are partnering with Forestry Fire and State Lands on as well. Uh, this will determine where we have sand naturally occurring, where we have marshy conditions, and add and really be a helpful tool for us on future planning for where we where we propose future beach enhancements, but we, where we really focus our efforts on, on <coughs> wetland restoration work uh, so that we know what's, what's inside that. And, and then the 30,000 that we talked about earlier in the meeting, which is our grants, our grant program for uh, improving access points. So those are the capital projects. And then the next page 
is the membership contributions. Uh, not a big change on any of those from last year. Uh, the municipal contributions adjusted one and a half percent. Department of Natural Resources adjusted there just slightly to, to incorporate uh, state parks onto the commission. Uh, but otherwise, uh, fairly similar to what we saw last year. <coughs> At the tail end of the document, you'll see uh, there was a request at our last governing board meeting to see what it would be, uh, what, it, what the contributions, how they would vary if we had all of this, the communities, municipalities, and the county involved. <coughs> so we, we pulled that up, and if you look at the right column of this membership contribution document, uh, the second to the right column says percent change. That would be how uh, those that are uh, members today, their contributions would go down, and, and on average it's about 10 to 12 percent less if all of the other communities were participating. So hang on to this, and if you're talking to your neighbor cities who are not members, um, you can let them know that it does make a difference if we, if we were to have the other, the other five or six communities that are not members right now, it would make a difference to, to each of the municipalities. Um, at this time, we'll open this to public hearing. Anybody from the public has any comments? Okay. Just on the recreation piece, I, yes, I uh, name and Joel, Joel Raker with Exploring Utah Valley. Perfect. Um, I, I talk with Eric regularly, but on the on the recreation and in that piece, I support 100% of the budget. In fact, we're we are working with the Utah Office of Tourism to try to get a familiarization tour on the lake. I think it's a great year to show it off. And the, uh, the vendor out there, I think, is doing a great job. And so we're in the process of, we've given them dates, and we're trying to land on a date where we'll bring uh, all of the content writers for the Visit Utah website and their public outreach. Um, I think that, you know, a few years back, I had a chance to go kayaking on the Great Salt Lake. It's horrible. The, 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 the water splashed on you, and it, the, the, the brine shrimp, and the... I mean, I, I don't want to badmouth sister destinations because we're all in this together, but it was a much better experience when we were out on Utah Lake with our family and stuff. So um, I, uh, they're, they're open to the idea, and I'm hoping we can get them down here and we can uh, try to elevate from what the county's investment is in us, the promotion from the state level. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk to Eric about that. In fact, I think it'd be great if, if, if uh, one of you guys could come out on that fam to kind of talk about the progress of the lake and stuff because it's very noteworthy and I apologize for interjecting this but I was glad to hear that when they were going through the budget that there's money for uh, doing promotion and things because we're trying to help you also. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Please. Uh, Jeff Hall. I just want, I, I appreciate how Eric, how you put that together because it dawned on me that <clears throat> the importance of that we've had a various cities around this table that have stepped forward over a number of years to show leadership towards <clears throat> improving something so vital to our community and I, I just know it's a heavy load and I, I know it's, a, it's an enjoyable load because we're seeing some tremendous things that are happening around Utah Lake. You know what your individual cities are doing as well as the improvements that have been made and I, I just think it, it would be great to have the rest of the cities that or having us shoulder their burden, I guess, is, is kind of how it, how it came across to me this time. And so thank you for those that are here that are picking up that burden and making it happen. It's making a big difference. And we'd encourage the other cities to really to, to join us and be part of the solution as we try to make Utah Lake a much better uh, place to recreate and to enjoy as part of this valley. <coughs> Any other public comment before I close public hearing? Seeing none, close public hearing. Um, members of the board, any comments, questions? Okay, I just have a little question. So, with the municipality donations or with the membership fees, it's still judged on population and shoreline, correct? Yes. We are a big chunk of that, so I just wanted to double check. Yep. Okay. I'm 
little short on you. Yes. <laughs> That's why we can do it. <laughs> Comments, I will make a motion on our budget for fiscal year 2020. We have a motion. I move that we adopt the 2020 budget as proposed. Councilman Blake and uh, Chris Middleton, Central Utah, for the second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Excellent, thank you. Um, at this time, we've got a presentation, I believe, on the Provo River Delta project. Do you want to My name's Mark Holden. I'm the director for the Utah Reclamation Mitigation and Conservation Commission. And most of you are probably somewhat familiar with the Provo River Delta Restoration Project. And I'd be willing to bet that everyone, rightly so, associates that with efforts to recover the endangered June sucker that lives in Utah Lake. But really the project is much more than that. It's also a part of Utah's effort to continue to have water development not only of uh, Central Utah Project water supplies, but other water supplies so that these sources can continue to provide uh, service to our communities. But it's also much more than that, and I'm really excited to hear about some of the other projects that are occurring uh, around the lakeshore with Wakaraway and the project in Vineyard. Because our project that we've planned and are ready to implement uh, has involved federal government, state government, local governments, communities, and it affords many of the same opportunities that have been talked about here this morning. And in a few moments, I'll ask Melissa Stamp. Uh, she's our coordinator for the Delta Restoration Project. And she'll go through uh, a little bit of detail about the project, somewhat of a reminder to some of you about what the different features are. Uh, and then at the end of that, I'll come back and uh, just have a few closing remarks and open up for questions. Um, we began the formal public scoping process for this project back in 2010. And through a, a lengthy process of working with local landowners, community leaders, and so forth, we completed our environmental, uh, res uh, environmental impact statement and records of decision in 2015. And four years later, through a lot more close work with the landowners uh, affected in the project area, I'm pleased to say that we have now uh, acquired, if I can figure out how to use this. Okay. We've got under contract uh, all of the land that we need for implementing the project. And the project area is kind of outlined in this hatched uh, black area. Okay. And so having the land acquired means we also have a schedule that we can share with you today. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, that schedule is a proposed schedule. Uh, but we have a, a, a plan to initiate construction, and we expect that that construction is going to take about four years. That's what we're planning on. And so uh, I'd like to turn it over to Melissa at this point, and she can cover some of the features of the project for you. Most of you are familiar with the project, so I'll just hit on a couple of the main features as kind of a recap um, of what's involved. One of the features I wanted to kind of highlight. The little teeny button is the air is the laser. Yeah. Okay. So one of the features I wanted to emphasize, and it'll be one of the first features that we have to construct um, starting next year, shown in red here is a berm that will um, 
to follow along the southern boundary of the project area, and that's needed to prevent those high river flows from flooding the property owners to the south. Another key element of the project involves lowering, partially lowering this portion of the existing Skipper Bay Dyke so that Utah Lake can expand eastward, occupy its natural shoreline. That area is known and marked on maps as Skipper Bay, so we're going to make Skipper Bay an actual bay of Utah Lake again. Um, and that to me is one of the really exciting aspects of this project is uh, opening up the levees, having a wide floodplain that can interact naturally as a natural delta would in this area. And that's, that's a real thing um, around Utah Lake and in the state um, where we've tended to channelize and levee most of our rivers as they enter river, uh, lakes and reservoirs. So within that restored delta area, we'll be building various braided channels, deep ponds that'll support kind of a deeper water habitat with some submerged aquatic vegetation. A lot of the area will be inundated, kind of this light shaded area, even in the summer because we'll be retaining a bit of a lip higher point that will pond that water and provide habitat um, throughout the summer even when the lake is low. Um, and really we'll be trying to create that blend of different habitat types, the, the bulrush marsh, those ponded areas, some riparian mounds where there's some trees and shrubs, that mix of habitats, the nursery rearing habitat that the Junesucker are currently lacking. The existing channel um, will be retained and water will continue to be delivered to the existing channel. A couple of the main features to point out is the diversion structure that will send the majority of the flow north into the new delta area, but then also deliver flow to the existing channel. Um, we'll also be constructing a small dam down near the state park that will pond that water and maintain a constant water elevation year round to support more continuous opportunities for, for non-motorized boating and other recreation activities. We'll be installing an aeration system in that portion of the existing channel to maintain healthy dissolved oxygen levels, um, maintain good water quality. Recreation features are also a big part of the project, and I think that's where Mark was emphasizing and just hearing some of the other projects planned. It's really exciting how well um, some of these elements are going to work together. And so one of the big features, recreation-wise, will be a paved trail along this southern berm, um, on top of that berm, and that's going to create a loop opportunity where it'll connect to the remaining portion of the existing Skipper Bay Dyke Trail. That'll link into the existing Purple River Parkway Trail, and then also have connections to um, the planned trail that will be part of Provo City's Lakeview Parkway. So a lot of trail connections, and then it sounds like the Wakara Way project is going to provide some connection at, at the north. So all this is going to work together and be really an amazing trail network around Melissa, really quickly, Park. do you yeah. have a website where all this information is where we can we share do. this out? Absolutely. It's ProvoRiverDelta.us, and I've got some slides at the end. We'll just hit on that now. I also, if any of you are not on our newsletter mailing list, we send those out a few times a year. You can sign up here, and I've got a fact sheet and our latest newsletter copies that you're welcome to take as well. The website is in there. It's it's a good website. We have a nice overview project video that's nice to share out if you want to give people a quick way to get an overview of what's involved. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so lots of trail systems. We're also planning some viewing towers out along the lake shoreline. We'll be developing a trailhead here called Skipper Bay Trailhead that will provide parking and access to the river for fishing and non-motorized boating. Um, this is just a rendering of what that trail on the berm will involve. It will also include an unpaved separate equestrian path along that new portion of the berm trail, so some opportunities if folks want to use horses in the area. Just some renderings of what some of the features are conceived to look like. Also along the existing channel, we're intending to improve Again, some access points for fishing and non-motorized boat access within that existing channel area. Um, we'll also be developing, in partnership with Provo City Parks, 
a trailhead park. Um, it'll be known as the Provo River Delta Gateway Park. It's been really wonderful to work with the Parks Department and the other staff at Provo City on all the interactions we've had. We've had a lot of interactions with the engineering department on regarding designs and integrating our designs for uh, the Delta and the new bridge that'll have to be part of the parkway road and trail system. Um, but the Delta Gateway Park, uh, we have a funding agreement in place with Provo City Parks. They've used that to hire a designer who's been working on some of these concepts for the park area. Um, <coughs> met with the neighborhood committee to get some design input and had an open house um, in April. And it's going to include a lot of great features. These are what's shown here is still preliminary. There's a lot of detail involved with kind of figuring out some of the constraints with the site, what's, what's possible within the budget we have, etc. But it'll have parking and restroom and some of those basic amenities. Um, the idea is also to include the nature play area and a lot of interaction with the, the river, ways for people to get down to the river and enjoy the river, um, as well as interpretive features. So it's going to be a really neat amenity um, and really a node where a lot of trail systems are connecting. Yes. Is there any efforts to look at the birding aspects of it? Because birding is becoming real popular, mm -hmm. and I know that that would be great if there's bird viewing areas or things like that. Yeah, because. that's part of what will be with the viewing towers. I think that will be a good opportunity out in the Delta area. Um, and we've had a discussion with the Utah County Birders Group and got some input from them about um, some design aspects for that. We also are funding uh, ongoing <coughs> bird monitoring um, project. One of the concerns is related to the Provo City Airport is nearby, and so we're wanting to get good baseline information. There's tons of bird use down there already. It's kind of a birding hotspot. Um, I imagine it will continue to be. Um, it will shift a little bit because we're shifting the types of habitats. There'll be less, uh, we anticipate fewer giant flocks of geese and ibis in, because we're kind of making it a little wetter than the ag fields right now. So changing those habitats. And we've been interacting with the, the airport and the FAA and wildlife services and various folks to kind of design features that will hopefully minimize some of the birds of greatest concern for aircraft. And we're really doing a very mosaic habitat out there with some higher ground areas mixed in with the ponds so there aren't just these great landing areas for giant flocks of birds. So trying to do what we can. Um, so it's a little bit counter to pro birding, but um, there will be a lot of songbirds and some of the other birds will be down there that aren't the concern for the, the aircraft as well. Um, so does that kind of answer your question? That, that, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious because yeah. that's... Yeah, no, it is going to be great. It already is, and it will be great for birding. On our website, too, if anyone is interested in the birding, bird monitoring results, there's some great maps of the <coughs> points and the data sets and so forth. So a lot of cool, if you're bird geek, there's lots to learn from there. Because <coughs> they're going out a ton, like three times a week, three times a day. So there's a lot of interesting information about bird use in the area. Okay, so schedule. As Mark mentioned, we've wrapped up our land acquisition, which is pretty monumentally huge for this project, um, and we intend to start major construction efforts next spring. Uh, for the rest of this year, we're going to be finalizing designs for that delta area and the berm and some of the engineered features. Uh, we're also continuing to coordinate with Provo City on their Lakeview Parkway construction. Um, we also have an agreement in place with Dominion Energy. There's a gas line that traverses our project that we need to bury deeper so that we can safely build ponds and put the river over top of it. There's a lot of wrinkles. It's a, it's a, it's a big and complicated thing to move a river, um, which is not a surprise, but it's an ambitious project. As Mark mentioned, it's not a huge area, but it will take a long time to build the project. It's a wet site. It's going to be challenging to, to be excavating out in that area. There will be mud, there will be noise, it's a big project. Um, we'll be making sure to keep the public and all of you updated on our website as things are happening. If there are times when you know, roads will be temporarily closed with detours or the trail will be uh, not available, trying to compress those as much as possible. We'll, we'll make sure that there's notifications about that. 
Um, so in 2020, the main efforts we'll be doing is constructing that berm that will be our primary construction access. We're also intending to begin initial phase of that Delta Gateway Park. Um, so the majority of the features that aren't dependent on the diversion structure being constructed. So the restroom and the uh, play areas and some of those features. We're hoping to get those in next year so the public can start enjoying that uh, trailhead park. And beginning the excavation, that's what's going to take almost three years to just get all that excavation work done. In 2022, things kind of get exciting. It's when we're going to lower Skipper Bay Dyke and let the, the lake in, send divert the river into the new delta area. The plan is to do that in late 2022. And then the final year of construction, once the river's moved, is when we can finish up the other recreation features, the trails, the features in the existing channel, and so forth. So that's kind of a summary of where we're headed over the next few years. Um, just want to emphasize, uh, Mark already kind of hit on this, really appreciate the chance to be here and appreciate the Utah Lake Commission. Um, probably missed some of the stakeholders that we've engaged with over, over the years. It's been years and it will continue to be years. Um, but <clears throat> the project is, is better because of the input we've received. I think it's more compatible and integrated with the other things going on in the area because of the involvement that we've had from stakeholders. So really appreciate uh, working with everybody that's been part of the project. This is a screenshot of our website easy to find um, and as I mentioned we've got materials of how to connect with us over here so I think Mark had a couple closing words yeah, thank you Melissa. Um, we're excited about it and uh, as we pointed out you know it's a four-year construction schedule I think Melissa you know mentioned that like any other construction project it's gonna look ugly before it looks beautiful Okay, there will be some disruption. We're going to try to work with, you know, the communities with Utah County, Provo City to minimize any, you know, closures of trail systems, things like that. Try to reduce those impacts. Uh, we have uh, this fall, Melissa mentioned we're finalizing our designs. This fall we'll be submitting our applications to the Corps of Engineers in the state of Utah that we need. Uh, she mentioned the Dominion energy uh, gas pipeline. Our hope and their hope is that they will be able to do that this year, uh, still in 2019, and open the door, if you will, for us to get out into that area and do the construction starting in 2020. Uh, as Melissa mentioned, we will uh, you know, gladly come and uh, give you updates once or twice a year, whatever uh, works well for you. And if any of your communities or groups that you represent or are involved with also would like a presentation or to learn more about the project, please contact me or Melissa. And by signing up, you'll also stay in contact then with progress as we move along. So thank you very much. We appreciate the chance to be here with you. I'm Kaylee Jorgensen. Yes, and I am currently the outreach specialist for Utah Lake Commission. I'm a student at Brigham Young University, um, studying experience design and management. Do you have that clicker there? <laughs> So first off, I just want to touch on the Volunteer Club. Um, most of you are probably aware of this already, but just as a reminder, the Volunteer Club was created because we had a high enough amount of people that would call in to the commission and ask about ways that they could help, help at Utah Lake and things like that. So we decided to um, establish this Volunteer Club. Uh, recently, we created these t-shirts um, which we were able to hand out to volunteers who helped at the Utah Lake Festival. Um, we had about 83 volunteers just at the Utah Lake Festival. And then we have an additional 49 volunteers um, who have signed up for a volunteer club overall. Um, as the volunteers signed up for the Utah Lake Festival, 
they also um, expressed interest in being a part of the volunteer club in future events. Um, this is a recap on our paddleboard camp. Uh, we've been able to help with that just these past two weeks or so. Um, it's a really fun opportunity to get kids out on the lake. Um, Joe Arby uh, heads this camp and um, it's really fun. We have we had about 40 to 45 kids in the past two weeks out at the paddleboard camp. They get to go learn how to use paddle boards. Um, they also enjoy recreation on the lake. They go boating, tubing, wakeboarding, skiing, jet skiing, all sorts of fun things. Um, and yeah, it's a great time. It's Monday through Friday. They have one more camp going from July 8th through the 12th. Um, this video play. It's been a godsend to a 53-year-old mother of an 11-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> the last two weeks, our son has been involved in it every day, and it's been great. <laughs> All right, so this is a video. Let's see if it'll play. No. We'll well, make sure we share the video with you, though. We will. All right, and then lastly, this is a proposed event that we have um, that we would like to establish for this summer. Um, we're thinking about doing an outdoor cooking night, uh, having a group of people come out to Utah Lake and learning how to cook in a Dutch oven. Um, we think it would be a great uh, way to get people out to the lake, have a good time and realize and notice how fun the lake can be. Um, and you don't just have to be out on the water, you can enjoy all the parks and marinas throughout the lake. So right now we're thinking about doing it at the Saratoga Springs City Marina. We've also looked at doing it at other marinas, but this is the one we're looking at currently. Um, we're thinking potentially doing it July 13th or July 17th. I believe those are Saturdays in the upcoming weeks. Um, and yeah, essentially it's just getting people out to the lake, doing something fun. We'll, we'll send more information as, it, as we solidify the date so that you can share that with your communities. I guess depending on where it ends up. If it's at Saratoga, it'll probably it'll be our main point. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Haley. Welcome. Glad to have you on board. Sam, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so there's two points on that I want to speak to today. There's actually a third that I forgot to include, which is a report on our Utah Lake Festival. My apologies for that. My wife had a baby last week, so I've barely been in the office and forgot to put that in my notes. Thank you for the applause. We're excited. Um, so the first item we had on there uh, is the Utah Lake Commission booth at City Festivals. So this effort was kind of twofold this year. First most, we wanted to try and outreach two communities better face to face. Um, second, uh, we want to partner with um, Division of Water Quality in an effort to publicize the Utah Lake Water Quality Study better as well. Um, so, so far this year, we've attended the Lehigh City Expo, the Cedar Hills Family Festival, and the Saratoga Springs Splash Days. Um, Lehigh City Expo, unfortunately, I haven't had the brilliant idea of counting how many people I talked to yet, so I don't have an exact number. But we had a lot of great conversations there, really enjoyed it. It was a very casual event, which made it, I think, comfortable for people to walk up to our booth a little bit better. Um, so we really enjoyed that. At the Cedar Hills Family Festival, that was a two-day event, and I did start tracking uh, on my phone. I was able to talk with, or we spoke with 107 people. I think seven or eight of those were city employees, and so they knew who we were, but the vast majority of people had never heard of us, didn't know about the work that's going on at the lake, and we were able to have a variety of very positive conversations. Um, first and foremost, I would say at both of those events, and also at the Saratoga uh, Splash Days event, more often than not, my main four questions end up centering on carp removal, algae blooms, which wasn't a surprise, um, the island restoration project that's been proposed, and then kind of generally in the fourth category was more questions about the state of the lake or amenities of the lake that people were trying to understand more about it. Um, so it was great to see so many people who hadn't heard about us. It was a good, I think, timing-wise with Cedar Hills joining recently to be able to go out to their their residents and say, hey, look, your elected officials care about the lake. They want to help take care of it. This is what we're doing. Um, at Saratoga Springs Splash Days, unfortunately, there was a severe thunderstorm. <laughs> so in the hour and a half before we had to very quickly take down our booth and run and hide, I was able, we were able to speak with uh, almost 20 people. I think it was 16, 17 people. 
Um, again, very much the same thing. People who weren't aware were very excited to hear somebody was doing something about the lake, had great questions about it, so a lot of great conversations. Um, so I think we'll definitely continue to pursue this, not only this year, but future years, so that we can have that face-to-face -face interaction because it provides a more human interaction, obviously, but also it allows us the opportunity to have a better conversation. Um, unfortunately, when we send out a newsletter, it's up to them to decide to read it or not. We don't really have a lot of connection with that. If it's on social media, it's quite easy to not reply or to make comments that maybe aren't near as positive uh, or much more humorous uh, in uh, content. Sam, I also think that it, it helps that um, you're able to dispel a lot of myths yes. about the lake and, and, and your personality lends itself to listening and yet correcting in a way that makes people comfortable with what we're doing. So thank you. Very true. Thank you. I appreciate that. And actually, to your point, I remember a, actually a Cedar Hills resident who uh, I was talking with who said, well, we'll just start going to the lake once they improve the amenity. There's just no beaches. And I was like, whoa, 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 hold on. <laughs> We've got Sandy Beach. We've got Lincoln Beach. We've got Linda Green has a beach. The State Park has a beach. And he was like, well, I didn't know. And we had another resident actually at Cedar Hills as well that said, well, last time I went to Linda Marina, it was kind of messy. I didn't really like it. I was like, oh, I'm sorry, like, when was that? She's like, oh, I think 10 years ago. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so there's a manager now, and there's a beach, and I, so it was very helpful to try and clarify these things for people and help straighten that out. Um, for the rest of the summer right now, we have scheduled to attend the American Fork Steel Days, um, Highland Fling, and Woodland Hills Days, and then I'll be evaluating if there's any others that we can fit in. Um, but definitely, I think each year forward, we'd like to kind of shoot for six to eight of these festivals here locally to have this face-to-face -face interaction. Um, speaking of festivals, the Utah Lake Festival, um, first and foremost, uh, some numbers, we had about 2,500 attendees, uh, so it was about 900 vehicles, I think, we added out. Um, a great event, a lot of great feedback, um, people were very excited on some of the recreation opportunities they had there. We were excited to have Shelly Barch in our booth with us talking to people, that was a lot of fun to have her helping with that, and uh, her son even had some great questions when he stopped by um, in between <laughs> paddleboarding and kayaking runs out on the water. Um, we definitely had some improvements, I feel like, on logistics where we were able to change things. Um, previously, last year, we had our booth right at the beginning near the start point of the festival where people pick up their punch card, where they come back at the end and collect their prizes. And we discovered we really didn't get to talk to people and have that face-to-face -face interaction. So we actually moved our booth back a little bit further into the festival. Um, Kaylee stepped up, did a great job. We had a family conflict with Eric, so he was not there that day. So. Uh, I was in our booth answering questions about the lake and our work, and Kaylee totally took on all the responsibilities that I normally run for the festival that day and did a great job of um, supervising all of our volunteers, which was a lot of people. Uh, normally, in previous years, we've only had 30. I think the highest we hit was 40 volunteers. So we had more than double the number of volunteers this year, and she did a great job of coordinating that. So I think, in my opinion, it went flawlessly, um, and we're excited to meet in the next couple of weeks with our planning committee. Uh, which draws from a variety of the agencies that are here and others uh, to discuss what we'd like to further improve um, and maintain the festival in, in coming years. Just to mention, um, Sam, on that, yeah. I think that having all those volunteers was a phenomenal resource for all those that were there. Um, to be able to see those in those volunteer shirts. Was yes, like her shirt did a great job of that. Yeah, it was great because they knew they could jump up and ask, you know, walking by, oh, hey, you know, you're going to know what's going on. Where do I find this? They did a great job. So pass Good. that to all the volunteers. It was a really excellent resource for everyone Great. And I think, and I appreciate it, I think her shirt did a great job of singling out those people because before they were just in their normal street clothes, nobody knew who they could turn to for help. And so with that effort, we actually prepared them this year better. We actually provided um, two maps because some things were marked on one and others, but they had all the information that we had as the festival coordinators. So if somebody said, hey, where's a water station? They could look at their map and say, hey, look, it's right here next to this booth. Or they could say, hey, where's paddleboarding? Or where's the Utah Lake Commission booth? Those volunteers all had that information and could provide that as well as uh, our staff. So I think it definitely was a great success. Um, the last thing on there is just the Utah Lake Commission, or excuse me, the Utah Lake Water Quality Study Communications Plan. Um, so uh, we are working um, with the DEQ communications team and some uh, <coughs> staff from DWQ to work on communications of this water quality study. Um, some successes so far this year, um, Division of Water Quality completely revamped their website. It looks great. It's very user friendly. Um, a great resource for public to be able to go and learn about it. Um, they also created a very easy link. It's just utahlake.deq.utah.gov, so it makes it very easy for people to find it instead of some very long uh, URL. 
Um, we've also posted it several times on our social media channels and asked the participating uh, organizations that are on the steering committee to reshare that um, and seen some success there. We also developed a list of all of the public information officers or social media coordinators for those various agencies. Um, quite similar to the list we have for your agencies, somebody in your social media or communications team, so that we can share information through those uh, audiences as well. Um, right now, we recently got a few messages, uh, specific messages approved through the steering committee that we'll put out on social media. Um, also, Scott Daly from DWQ plans to attend several of these city festivals with me the remainder of the summer so that we can better discuss uh, various elements of the water quality study with people and seeing as algae blooms is always one of our number one questions, I think it will pair very well to discuss this study with people uh, on that topic. Um, so long story short, the communications continues to improve. We've seen a lot of good success this year and uh, it's been a pleasure to work with DEQ's team and DWQ on those communications. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. We've got an update on our water quality soon. Okay. That's me. Um, so, uh, since this group last met, uh, we've met with both our steering committee and the uh, science panel. Um, I think the science panel more than once, but I'll give you an update on the science panel activities. <coughs> As you were aware, they've been charged by the steering committee to uh, look at a number of high level questions. Um, I want to highlight from the steering committee meeting that I, we should discuss maybe is a slight change to, um, in addition to the char high level charge questions relating to what is the historical condition of the lake and what is the current status of the lake and what's needed to uh, develop nutrient criteria. They felt, the steering committee felt that <coughs> the um, future charge questions relating to uh, what's the best steady state environment of the lake uh, with regard to once you achieve all these reductions, once you achieve, achieve carp removal, and et cetera, uh, what, you know, what's the best case scenario? They felt that that, might, that future uh, consideration uh, might get ignored in this, in this evaluation, so they recommended that you know, it kind of be pulled a little bit closer in the timeline to those initial charge questions. But that said, those initial charge questions are the logical first step. So to that end, um, the science panel has been working to uh, answer a number of those questions that we don't have information on. Um, and this summer we wanted to, as you're probably aware, get uh, a few studies uh, started quickly um, that we know are going to be questions that need to be answered. And those have to do with the paleolimnology of the lake, the historical status of the plant life, and the, and the phytoplankton that grow in the lake, um, looking at uh, sediment nutrient dynamics in the lake, and the um, third one being uh, looking at a bioassay to look at various nutrient concentrations and treatments uh, in, uh, in, a, in kind of a controlled e experiment. And so two of those were approved by the science panel. The um, paleolimnology study uh, is going to be performed by Janice Brainy at USU, and the bioassay uh, study is going to be performed by Zach Andrew at BYU. And, um, I just heard from Scott, and he said that the sediment study, they were, had some details to work out, but they, they negotiated those with the contractor. Uh, but I'm not at liberty to say that until the steering committee gives the final <coughs> approval, um, and it, it's all set and done. But those are going to be on their way this summer, which is, which is good. Um, and we, we're going to our water quality board next, next week to have them actually grant the money directly to the researchers to help facilitate and expedite that contracting process. So that should be all formalized by next week. Um, we also got a, a, at the science panel, uh, the contractor Tetra Tech started to do a lot of the questions, uh, or started to provide answers, at least uh, initial analyses on a number of the questions that the uh, steering committee uh, posed or the science panel developed um, well, uh, regarding the looking at carp excretion rates, looking at wind and turbidity and effects on sediment and trailing and stuff like that, and also how that turbidity might affect um, macrophyte growth. And so they're getting started on those, they're in the initial phases and they're evaluating those uh, data analysis steps. Um, and we have a two-day science panel meeting July 11th and 12th. Uh, in addition to the ongoing you know, scientific questions that the panel will be evaluating, um, they're going to 
try to include possibly discussion of uh, or, a, or a presentation on what are the costs of upgrades to uh, wastewater facilities, try to keep that in the back of our heads um, as we go along. And also to host possibly a QA and a if we have time from our steering committee because they want to stay engaged in uh, understanding the, the, the thought processes that come with things and some of the science kind of There's any questions? Um, Eric, did I miss anything you wanted? That's great. <coughs> I guess we were going to mention that the permanent signage. Yep. Uh, those are all installed at the seven access points listed there. Uh, and the uh, county health department right here uh, will go out uh, occasionally as there is an isolated bloom or, or a large scale bloom. Uh, there is a warning sign and a dangerous close sign sandwiched together underneath these educational signs that they can just go out, unbolt them, and make the one visible that, that is uh, pertinent to that <coughs> advisory of the day. Do you have a picture of the signage? I sure do, and not on my presentation, but uh, I, I, I will, I'll, I can send that out. It, the, the signage is, uh, there's about a two foot by four foot sign at all the access points, and at the bottom of it there's a few photos of uh, blue-green algae, so that people know what to look for, and then a, a description of of that same phenomenon and the things to not do if you see it. So, and and a link to the habs.utah.gov uh, phone number for poison control of people we encounter. So it's, the idea is that we have an educational sign at the access point where people are coming and using the lake as a water body so that when they arrive they can look through it and make a uh, a wise decision when they get out in the middle of the lake and they don't see any problems, go ahead and recreate. If they head into a bay and see some problem areas, that's a good one to avoid. So our idea is that rather than it just being splashed in the media regularly, uh, we would get uh, folks that are actual lake users um, in front of good information as they arrive at the lake to check. And sorry for not having that picture today. Try that one. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And did you want me to say something about the balloon that we had? Uh, yeah. So, so the signs were put to use this week um, or last week initially. Um, we had a report of a, a bloom around May 30th. We sampled and, and um, confirmed that there was a significant bloom at the, the um, Saratoga Springs area. So we, uh, we issued it on June 5th. We confirmed it. We issued a, uh, an advisory, which was removed um, summarily on the 17th after some additional sampling. It was a short-lived event that just concentrated on the area. And that was at the city monitoring Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think some of the messaging on the sign kind of talks about what to look for and what to avoid. It doesn't indicate that the entire lake is closed, unless it says that. Uh, but the warnings are to indicate that. You know, just use common sense and avoid these areas where this is occurring. Well, that might be part of the marketing that STEM does to, at the festivals, is to remind people that if there's an isolated case, the rest of the 29 access points are still open and, and safe to use. If, if I may. So those are actually, that's a great point. Those are the two things that we always hit on when we discuss out the is A, it usually, or at least can be isolated, and B, we try and make sure we educate them on what can be done. For instance, one common thing is people say, well, the lake's closed, I can't fish. Well, a warning advisory completely allows for fishing. The recommendation is to clean it well and discard the guts, which 
you're going to eat your fish, you should be doing both those things anyway. <laughs> so we always make sure we hit on those two things. Though. It can be isolated, so make sure you're informed as to where it is, and then make sure you're understanding what that advisory means. Is there a uh, place on a website that can be updated uh, as people look at that? Then? This yeah, we, up, we update our web page okay. routinely when we get data, when we, just, when we announce any warnings or closures, um, we provide the data. And that's on your web page. Habs, habs, habs. Uh, you H A B S. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, as a water district, nothing makes us happier than actually have a water supply to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this year we've had kind of a model, and uh, Tom uh, Bruton has uh, joined us at our invitation uh, today. He does a great water supply report, and so uh, we've invited him, and I appreciate very much him coming and joining us. But Tom kind of instigated while you're setting up, Paul. I'll We're ready. This, I'm, I'm really interested in our what you're model. Well, Tom <laughs> started with a model in January. January. December, when we're doing a UNA Basin Water Conference. Says uh, all we need is one storm a week. Um, and see, nicely uh, see what happened uh, after well, about May and June. I, I plagiarized it from the old Blue Diamonds Almond commercial. A can a week is all we ask, a storm a week is all we ask. So oh, it's not yeah, original. But. After a while, it wasn't quite as humorous as it was to begin Yeah, I started getting some <laughs> retaliation. Yeah, I was getting in trouble pretty quick. We, uh, we thought there might be breaks in between the storms, but um, anyway, we are delighted uh, with your uh, with this year's water supply, and we're also delighted that Tom could come and join us this morning. I think you'll enjoy it. Well, appreciate it. Feel free to stick your hand up, interrupt, whatever. Um, I do these all over, both in Central and throughout the state during the, during the runoff season. Utah Lake's a critical hub in Central Utah Project Operations, as you're well aware. And this year, for it to have risen as much as it did is, is nothing short of miraculous. So I like to start with something a little bit just off the beaten path. I hope you have gotten out to see the runoff. <coughs> I'm in my 33rd year with the Central Utah Water Conservancy District. My first 29 years were out in the Uinta Basin, managing resources in that area. The last few years I've been out here in Orem. But I, I always marvel at, at flowing water and the animals and things like that. Snowy egret there, that's the happiest face I've ever seen on a bird in my life. Is it, It's there with the, in the Duchesne River above Knight Diversion Dam. I don't know if you're familiar with the Uinta Basin. Some of you might have roots there. Seems like everybody comes from the Uinta Basin or San Pete County, something like that. You know, rural Utah at its best. So, anyway, appreciate being here. Water supply update for the Utah Lake Commission today. Um, we do a lot of, uh, we take a lot of pictures in our organization. And if you happen to see something water related and would like to send it to me, Tom at CWCD.com, pretty short email, uh, feel free to do it. We, uh, our staff on, on their work time get a lot of pictures. Uh, also on their private time as they're, as they're hiking through the Uinas or seeing gardens or, or the various facilities. This is out in Wasatch County. One picture I'd like to show you to kind of introduce the, the runoff is this one. This is a diversion dam up on the Yellowstone River in Duchesne County, not to be confused with, with up in Wyoming. It's a beautiful little spot. Uh, it actually backs water up that feeds a small hydroelectric power plant uh, a little ways downstream. Just, it's just very inviting. You feel like you want to walk out there, put your hand in that lovely waterfall. Well, go ahead. This is it right now. Two or three days ago. 1,500 cubic feet per second. Now, I'll, I'll say CFS cubic feet per second, or if I go back to my rural roots, I will say second feet. They all mean the same thing. Okay? And I'll be talking in terms of acre feet. Acre foot is a quantity of water. If you take a football field, put it one foot deep, that is about an acre foot. Okay? All right. So this, is, this has just been, as, as Christine mentioned, just a fabulous spring. There is a little bit of snow left. Now, if you've, you've probably seen some of these charts. Look at these percents. Here we are in June, and we're at 1,167% on the Provo uh, River area and 1,366% out there. Okay. What happened was there's a lot of snow left, 
and the average value has dropped all that time, and so the average for a given day now is like 0.1 inch, and there's still 10 inches of snow, so do the math. So don't take this too seriously when you see these. There was actually a number from two days ago that showed the Duchesne River at 25,900% of normal. Okay, highest number I've ever seen. So we love our NRCS people, we love our, our uh, um, National Weather Service and NOAA people. They provide great information to us, we have great meetings with them. But anyway, there is some snow, a uh, few elements of confusion. Uh, Sand Hill Cranes up at Strawberry Reservoir didn't know what to do for a while while there was still quite a bit of snow up there. Um, if you've gone over the summit, Wolf Creek Pass, if you go up through Cam or up to Cam well you can come down from Camas, Francis Woodland, so you go by Jordanelle, Francis Woodland, that road takes you up over Wolf Creek Pass, peaks almost at uh, 10,000 feet and then drops into the Tabby Hanna area on, in the Uinta Basin. June 7th, there was still, I took this picture, there was still three or four feet of snow up there. Uh, those of you that like the Mirror Lake Highway, sorry, it's still closed. They're still trying to plow into that. So there's, there's still a little bit at the very highest elevations. Uh, in my opinion, as far as the efficiency of this runoff, it is the, it is the best on record. The snow came off. We were a little bit worried. Everybody remembers 2011 and some of the things. Some of you, and I won't say who, might remember 1983. I do. And, and that was different in that we had not an exceptionally high, in 83, not an exceptionally high snowpack year, it just lasted way late and all elevations of snow came down at once. We were tracking pretty close with 2019 the 83 snowpack, a little bit higher in fact. But what happened was the way the runoff came, it melted layer by layer, elevation by elevation, almost perfectly, and when I say efficient, that means we were able to control things as well as other water users through reservoirs and streams to, to allow storage, to hopefully mitigate floods, and we'll get into a few you know, warnings that have been out there and stuff. But it's been, in my terms, just all, an all but perfect year. Um, okay, precipitation. I don't know if you've seen these charts before. Again, the uh, National Weather Service puts these out. The meteorological spring is considered March, April, and May of a given year. The color chart scheme on here, and don't, don't worry about the numbers necessarily, the cooler colors, meaning the blues and those, that dark purple, are high, and the warmer colors, meaning the yellows, oranges, and, and, and the reds, are low. Okay, this is Utah. You're going to see that work there. So you've got, you've got the state of Utah right here. March was absolutely wonderful. Okay, now when I say that, those that don't like to shovel snow or something like that are going to disagree with me. But as a water manager, Every time I look at a mountain, my first thought is which drainage is it, in, is it in, and which reservoir is it going into, and who's going to get that under contract. So I, I have a distorted view of things. But as you look there, we're in very, very high snowpack. April does the same thing. May was incredible. I call it crazy May. This was a crazy May because it was a snowstorm a day, for, or a, a rainstorm a day. You know, it, was, it was just unbelievable. And we've had a few of those over the last few years. Um, some of you might recognize this guy, okay, he just got back from 2157 and it's still raining. That was his worry and that's the way it was in May. It was just totally incredible. Okay, if you take all, those, all of those three charts plus go all the way back to October, so this is the beginning of the water year, it has been a great year to date. Now, the future, are we going to have our monsoons? Um, I was speaking with uh, Ashley Nielsen. She works, she's a hydrologist with the National Weather Service and NOAA. And they can't quite forecast that exactly. But with all the rains and things we have, we could have the monsoon season at least as early as normal, maybe a little earlier. And, and Brian, I'm sure, has promised us all we won't have any fires this year, right? Because, well, is that, oh, I, that's not the promise, huh? Okay, <laughs> just checking. Just wanted to throw that out there. But, uh, we are, you know, we've had a wet season, a really, really wet season. So far, all I've seen is low on the signs. I hope that stays there, but I understand that things can change. So, anyway, great water. So here's, that's the potential there. Um, now, this is the actual precip values. To date, we're running about 140% out in the Uinta Basin, 100, about 130%. So again, just good, good, good. Um, 
Is it rained a lot? Yes, yeah, spring in 2019, second wettest on record in Salt Lake City. Again, to think it only rained twice this spring, once for 45 days and again for 35 days. And to see the numbers for Salt Lake, uh, 2011 was the highest, 11.73 inches, 2019, 11.18, just a tremendous amount. In some places, it was the highest on record. Alpine, just to the north, 13.78 inches. Altamont, out in the Uinta Basin, 6.21. Uh, you know, Little Sahara Recreation Area, 8.5 St. George even, even beat its record. So, very, very high precips. Um, and back in May, we started wondering about the runoff and if there's going to be flooding and, and things like that. And Brian McInerney, you probably all know him too. He's quite famous on radio and TV and things. Had this quote, Utah's bipolar weather patterns over the last several weeks have created the perfect conditions to avoid flooding while also filling just about all the state's reservoirs. It's the optimum scenario we had hoped for. In my language, it's will it rain, will it snow? I live in Utah, I do not know. <laughs> so what happened? We had a little of both. There were some reaches banked full in many cases. That is good. Rivers need cleaned out, I call it. They have, you have growth that comes in over the dry years. You need to have them open. Do we want flooding? Heavens no. Our project is built to, to mitigate flooding. Jordan L has a big space to, to, uh, to be used if necessary to prevent flooding. Starvation reservoir. We operate all our reservoirs that way. But we, uh, it's good to have this kind of condition. This is the Provo River. Uh, near Woodland. Uh, when I took that picture, it was running about 2,232nd feet. It peaked at 2,460. That was the peak for the season. Here is on the Duchesne side, and here is where I need to, to commend cities and counties for the work they did in 2011. This is a, a piece of property, the Benson property in Tabby. If you haven't been to Tabby, that's a beautiful little spot in the Hidden Valley in Utah. Just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, a Benson place. This is all sandbags in 2011. 2011 was, was absolutely crazy. Uh, and the county, after they, they did a great work, and this is just one example, I'm talking Duchesne County. I know these, all the other counties were doing the same thing. This is all the work they had to do. This year, as the flows picked up, and they weren't quite as high, pretty close, they had all these riprap materials and things, you know, carefully placed. Uh, they replaced the bridge that's actually right here. So we, as a district, are grateful for that infrastructure that cities and counties put in to help allow these type of large flows to, to proceed. One recommendation, be careful on, on city ordinances and county ordinances on, uh, on encroachments. It's a beautiful little stream, you know, in the fall. You want to build right your house right to the edge, maybe even put a deck on it. But Mother Nature wins this game. And we've seen some horrible things happen, decks torn out. I mean, there's just nothing you can do. The river wins. So be careful on that. Look at your flood control and stuff. Important things there. Uh, I'm not, I'll get into the human element. That's even the biggest thing to really talk about. As you move down the system, um, pretty sunset out in the basin there, 1,300 second feet uh, in the lower part of the Duchesne instantaneous peak of 2200. You're probably saying, now why are you talking about Duchesne? I'm going to tie this in here in just a minute. Because you rely on Starvation Reservoir, whether you know it or not, all the way out in the basin in order for Utah Lake to, to for things to happen out here. Um, I'm going all the way to Mighton. You probably saw in the paper or on the news they had some flood warnings. You know, we're starting to get up to some decent flows. 4,600 CFS, a big chunk of water. And they had to, uh, you know, they did some preventative work there, a little bit of, a little bit of sandbag sandbagging. Uh, the river almost reached about 4,700. I think it actually went up to about 4,900 second feet. Um, we had to coordinate, and again, I, I, I commend the, the partnering. We work with multiple water users outside Central Utah Water Conservancy District. Provo River, Strawberry Water Users Association, uh, Moon Lake out in, out in the basin. We work with NOAA. These people all got together on a periodic basis, <coughs> weekly, daily if necessary, to coordinate operations and to get forecasts. There is a lot going on behind the scenes on a daily basis as the rivers start to flow. And I commend all them, and again, cities, counties, and all those that participated with us. Um, reservoirs. Again, we were happy when we filled. Wayne Pullen, he works here down at the Provo Area Office. These are the years we really like. The system we put together relies on Mother Nature's occasional generosity. Great term. 
We have designed our dams for the most part for carryover storage so we can take a good year and make sure we have enough water for the next few years. The brilliance of the Central Utah Project are large reservoirs that can take large inflows and use them over multiple years. They aren't a fill one year and use it all one year. Strawberry Reservoir, depending on conditions, could last 10 years. Many, many dry years could be, could be held. Okay, now, if they're all dry all at once, wouldn't go quite that long. Jordanelle, five to seven year range. Uh, um, starvation, three to five year range. So that's, that's the, the, the federal investment has been huge. And it's been huge because it has the vision of being able to be used over multiple years. Uh, okay, now start doing the numbers. And I don't know what number you said for Utah Lake. I heard you gave him some numbers. We, we, uh, a few days ago, we said it was 0.64. It's close. Close enough? 0.59 is what Okay, we, for 500s, we won't call each other a liar. We're fine now. So. Okay, now, interesting thing here, I'm sure Mark Holden loves to see this kind of fish coming out of Utah Lake. Okay, this gentleman... Uh, as he was fishing there, finally got a quick glimpse of his back, he decided it was a nice walleye, got him to the net and realized what he caught, a 38-inch northern pike. Now my question is, how many June Sucker has that eaten? Too many. Too many. Okay. Now that's one that they take out and, and get rid of, but that's, that's a huge fish. That's a big one. So, all right, good. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we move up to Jordan now, 99% full, it's all but there. As we move up into the higher parts of the Provo River, Lost Lake is spilling, Trial Lake is spilling. Uh, as we go over into the Strawberry River or Strawberry Valley area, Strawberry Reservoir is 91% full. Now, who, which holds more water when they're full, Utah Lake or Strawberry Reservoir? Strawberry. Strawberry, Strawberry Reservoir. It's over a million right now. One meat. You want to guess how much? One Pretty close. Well, it's actually a little bit higher. This was as of June 9th. This was as of yesterday. I'm sorry, I'm one day behind on this. <laughs> this is what I gave to our board yesterday. So 1,005,305 acre feet. Full is 1,106,500 acre feet. We are just barely 100,000 acre feet shy of being full. This reservoir, I was a part of the, uh, the latter years of the first filling when, uh, when the Soldier Creek Dam was, was in full operation. And in my recollection, I think it has only surpassed a million acre feet three times. I think that's, that's the only times it's done that. So it's done a couple of times we kind of had to hold it down because the reservoir's not under full operation, but that's kind of a rare thing to hit the million. It's still um, going up. And it is going up. It's still going up. We'll go through where everything, good point. Appreciate that. We'll start telling where they're going to get before the end here in just a minute. I don't know if you forecast, did some forecasts or not. So. Current Creek, which is on the Strawberry Aqueduct Collection System, I'll show a map of that in a minute. Uh, that's just a pretty picture of it. Some of you might have been there. It op it, it's basically an operational reservoir. It doesn't fluctuate over four feet. It's a break between a large pipeline above it and a large pipeline below it and allows us operational flexibility. Okay, Upper Stillwater. Upper Stillwater is at the headworks of uh, the Strawberry Aqueduct and Collection System. It started spilling two days ago. Um, I'll work with you. If we do this again, we can show, I can show you a live video of it spilling. We have our security cameras on it. We showed it in our board meeting yesterday. At this time, it was running 1,467 second feet. I just checked it. It's pushing 1,700. That spillway is two football fields wide, and this is a little bit taller than Niagara Falls. It is very deceiving. If you have not seen it, take your family, go up and take a look. And that's part of the message. Go up and enjoy these places. They're amazing. I, I was here the first time this thing spilled. I walked the foundation of that dam. I've seen it do this 30-some times, well, 30-some years. It hasn't done it every year. It's still amazing. I started out with my little family of, uh, of two, and now I'm going to take my, all my, my kids up there and eight to ten grandkids. It's still an amazing thing to see. Go see that. Um, this is our map of the, of the project. And just very quickly, um, you probably, I'm sure you understand the exchange aspect of this, how the project has to work. Uh, the water rights on the Jordan River, try to get, there we go, these have the highest priority. And so as the project was built, it was recognized that that priority would be interfered with as facilities were built on the Provo River, particularly on Jordan L. So Jordan L, storage here, as it's brought down and put through the treatment plants, that affected Utah Lake and the water rights here. In order to keep the water rights whole and to keep Utah Lake operational, 
another water supply had to be provided. Well, ta-da, that's where the strawberry aqueduct and collection system came, came into place. Here's upper still water, here's some small diversions. Um, Current Creek, we showed a picture of here, strawberry. Water from strawberry then is used to exchange into Utah Lake so that these reservoirs can operate here and run, and run water through the treatment plants, particularly again Jordanelle. This system interferes with senior water rights out in the Uinta Basin and Starvation Dam had to be built so that winter flows and peak flows during the runoff could fill this, provide these senior rights, allowing this to divert water into strawberry, which then when this water was, ta was, was taken out of the Provo, we could put the water there and that'll be your test question. <laughs> Okay, this is a huge system, lots of agreements, it even goes all the way to Lake Powell. It even goes all the way to the, the flow of the, in the Lake Powell and the Colorado River and things. We won't get into that. Okay, this is back to your question. Those, oh, these numbers we have, these were our original forecasts. We, only, we thought that Utah Lake would get about 2.8 feet below compromise because we weren't sure what was going to happen in May. There's such a surface area on Utah Lake that if it gets really hot, you're evaporating a thousand second feet every day. It's just amazing. And then you would also have more usage downstream. Well, the opposite happens. The opposite happens. It was cold, it was, we had more inflow, we had less evap, we had less usage, and voila, we're at 0.64 below, okay? So that was probably our biggest, I won't say a bust, but because it's hard to predict the weather, if any of you's got a handle on that, we'd appreciate it. Um, still, or, Strawberries at 91, fills to 92 was our forecast. The rest of these, it was pretty obvious. They were all going to fill. Um, and here's what's happening now. We love the word spilling. You can see it there. I always uppercase still waters because that's the prettiest one. Everything is still going up. We're hoping, as of yesterday, <coughs> I heard in our board meeting, 0.5, zero. Quick question, why is strawberry, is it just a really deep reservoir? Is that Very right? deep, 200 plus feet, yes, that's exactly right. Surface area here is about 17,000 acres, and obviously this is a heck of a lot more. So that's what it is, it's just a very deep reservoir. 1.1 million, this one compromised, what, 870,000, if I remember right. So yeah, 870,000 here, 1.1 million, but it's a depth, it's depth. Uh, a very deep, very deep reservoir. And everything else, uh, starvation will spill in a few days. We're coordinating s releases with other reservoirs. We, you don't want to take all your reservoirs and dump them in the stream at once for obvious reasons. You coordinate the spills. It's kind of like an orchestra thing, and it gets quite fun. Like I said, I used to get excited about it. I've been doing this a long time. Um, anyway, so we're, we're, doing, we're doing that right now. Still water is spilling. Moon Lake Reservoir, a little farther to the east, not spilling yet. We're working with them. Starvation's pulling water in. It will spill third, so it's still water, Moon Lake, then starvation, and then we're to the tail end of the, of the runoff season. Um, we're hoping this, I heard yesterday in board meeting, might get as high as 95%, which would be, be absolutely tremendous. And then this coming up to about 0.5. Jordan will top off in the next day or two. Deer Creek's already full. So, Tom, because yes. there's so much snow, when, when do you say that the runoff season ends? What's the date of Okay, officially, snow all over. There's, officially the runoff season is April 1st to July 31st. Okay. okay, that's the official runoff. When you say, when's, what's the runoff season? April 1 to July 31. Now, when it actually starts is depending on, you know, how much precip you're getting and then particularly how it warms up. And if it stays cool, it keeps pushing it back farther and farther, and you have a much more grand runoff season because the snow comes, comes down a lot That's faster. That's what happened in 83. That was 83. 2011 to a little, a little bit. It got pushed back a little bit. You know, you have a perfect, if I were to, to draw a, a, a hydrograph starting April 1, so just pretend this is a graph now. You know, it would go up nice here about June and come down like this in July. That would be perfect. What on 83 and on some of those years, it stays down here low, gets to mid-June, gets hot, and then you get the river down Center Street and Salt Lake or whatever, and it goes very, very steep like that. Okay, ours, ours was pretty gentle. It was a good one. This year was great. So that's how, that's how that worked. Yeah, great question on that. Um, just, I, I can't say how much we're appreciative of how the weather uh, held up. Okay, a few other regional water bodies you might be interested in. Great Salt Lake, uh, 
It's come up two and a half feet since last year's catastrophe, basically. What happened, I graphed this out, it's from the USGS, and I've got all the credits on here, who's, doing, who's got what. This goes back to the spring of last year. So spring of 18, we had a horrible dismal runoff. Um, the water, the lake evaporated, got down here, and then this is our runoff this season. So it's gotten back almost to where it was. Now that's comforting, but you, the Great Salt Lake can go up a lot more, and that would be a great thing. Um, lake Powell is increasing from, uh, uh, Lake Powell's water line is climbing between 6 and 15 inches a day, prompting recommendation that boaters and visitors park their vehicles 300 yards away from the shore, lest they become submerged overnight. Now, I think that means over a weekly period, because I don't know of a car that's only 15 inches tall, but it's, the point is, it's coming up very, I'll show you a graph, it's coming up a lot. Uh, in comparison, Upper Stillwater came up 9.53 feet one day this year. That is half of the record that I have seen. I have seen still water come up 20 feet in one day. Okay, that will put your car underwater overnight. So it's just amazing the dynamics. People were going up to still water saying, when's it gonna spill, when's it gonna spill? And it's way, way down. And I said, just give it two days and it's over the top. That's, it's a very dynamic reservoir. With, with reservoir. rise like that, because I know, for example, still water, there's a campground at the mm -hmm. base of the dam. Mm -hmm. I assume it's channeled properly or whatever, but I mean, is that something that they need to worry about? Is that something you need to worry about? We work very well with Ashley National Forest people out there. You know, some of you know them, and and, uh, and we've got signs, river may rise without warning. The, the campgrounds were designed so that they would be at elevations above the anticipated spills. Now, that doesn't mean you can't, if you want to take your tent and go down to the nice lazy river and put it there and then nice. spill, that, but there's, there's a lot of communication, and, that's, and we're getting to that point real quick on the safety aspect of this. Um, it's quite dramatic. Um, I know a, a, a lady that works at the office was in one of those campgrounds. Have you been up there? Do you uh, know? No, that's oh. my plan to go. You need to go. Yeah, about it you need to go. Yeah, we'll, we'll do, I'll let Chris do that invite here at the end. Um, she was there with some of her grandkids, and the, the reservoir starts spilling in the middle of the night. And it's loud. And finally, one of those little grandkids come in and say, Grandma, can you turn it off? It's just too much. <laughs> you know? That's Debbie, uh, Christine. For, so it's, it's quite the thing. I guarantee it's a jaw dropper. So anyway, so Lake Powell coming up, that's great because there's a very complex series of agreements on how the Colorado River is run. And we love to see things like, you know, this is a graph. That's almost vertical. That is amazing. And we still got room for it to go up. Again, this is the start of the most dismal year in runoff history. The precip in 2018 was the lowest in the history of the state of Utah, according to the National Weather Service. The lowest in 133 years of record. So this, you know, showing the, the, the effect in Utah. Now, Lake Powell covers multiple states, obviously. You've got Colorado, the whole upper basin there of the Colorado came down and it's coming back up. So, you know, we can afford a few more years like this. Um, this comes back to kind of your, your thing. Be careful. Just be careful. These are just headlines from, from this year. Um, that water's fast. That water's cold. Uh, particularly children and pets. And, you know, we want to avoid the catastrophes and things. So if you go out and see these things, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to put my grandkids on a leash. I'm not sure I'm going to keep them in a, I don't know what I'm going to do. But just be very, very careful. So, um, and finally, if you're in Wasatch County, please be responsible with your camel and obey all leash laws that they have right here. And you can even look at your cell phone while you're walking your camel. This happened Monday. Okay? This is dead serious. So, and it's a common thing. So anyway, I don't know if that, you guys do that around here. I know the Rainbow people were up there one time. If you know them, Uncle and Kenny. Anyway, we're so that's... Well, yeah, okay, appreciate that. So be responsible with your camels. Um, that's the presentation. I'm going to defer back to Chris on the invitation. Um, we do a lot of things. We've done a lot of things. We have three and a half billion dollars in infrastructure. It's flowing right now like mad. It's just get out and kind of see it. We could, I could be here for hours going through how our contracting works, stuff like that. I'm sure Chris will offer whatever, and she probably doesn't want me back because I'm going too far, so I will turn it to you back to you. And I have to excuse myself for another meeting. So, Chris. Thank you. Just one more comment. Uh, Tom, would you give directions, uh, the best directions on getting out to Upper Stillwater? Okay. Go to Heber. Take a right, Highway 40. 
You're going to go up over, you'll see up Daniels Canyon, you'll see Strawberry. What? I got to do some advertising. When I was coming back on, on Highway 40, I saw a moose and a deer and two sandhill cranes within an area about this room. I mean, there's just wildlife everywhere. I've seen bear up there, mountain lions, the whole bit. So go on down, drop into the Uinta Basin, you'll go through Fruitland, there's a little white church on the side of the road. You keep going, you drop into Duchesne, there is one stoplight in Duchesne, okay? I almost, took, I thought I might have to move when I saw that stoplight building. I don't know if I could, I've never been in a town very long that's had a stoplight in my life. There's one stoplight, make a left. Is it just a flasher though? Or is it no, it's actually a semi, yeah, it's, I, that's the kind I'm used to. I, there's still one of those in Woodland, so if you go that way, you can still enjoy one of those. There used to be one in Mount Pleasant when I grew up in Sand Peak County, okay? So that's what I was used to. So then you, then you just follow the signs. Once you're going north, and that's uh, Highway 87, and it's about 40 miles, and there's just there's signs that say Upper Stillwater. And you only have to make two more lefts. Once you, go, once you make the left at Duchesne, you'll go about 15 miles out of town. There'll be a sign that says left. That'll take you to a small village called Talmage. There's one more left right there. There's a, there's a bed and breakfast that's a former uh, LDS church and stuff. You make the left right there. And then 26 miles. And if you don't stop, you're in the middle of the reservoir because that's where the road ends. Okay. So the first left is off of 40. First left's on 40 oh. at the stoplight. Yep. I tell you, I give you the Duchesne directions. Like stop at you know so and so's house, and so and so's got the cows in the field now. Make a left there. You know, I give you those. Six miles is after you turn off the road. Yeah, it's 40 miles from Duchesne, but it's about 20. Yeah, it's about 26 once you make the last left. You will be crossing uh, Udinian Tribe Reservation. A little caution there. If you stop, don't be wandering off. You, there's a right-of-way across, the, across the, uh, the land there for the highway. But, uh, and then just enjoy the views. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. You will be out in the oil field country. You'll see a lot of, of uh, wells and things. There's a lot going on out in the basin that way. So. And, and when you get there, the road is paved all the way right, yep. right to the dam. And when you make that up, you will have no question about where, whether you're there. Or not. Oh man! It is spectacular when you come around uh, the last corner, and you're right at the base of that dam, and it is higher than uh, Niagara Falls, and so it's uh, it's an impressive sight trip. We've uh, for years I've taken tours up there, people and stuff, and when we have foreign people, we have a lot from you know Middle East. Uh, China, um, all over Europe, you know, places like that. If they're not a native English speaker, invariably, if it's spelling, you know, we're, we're communicating very well. They're usually pretty good English speakers. Once they see that, they go to their native tongue. <laughs> they cannot stay in English as they talk to each other about it. It's that impressive. So, so um, it's, uh, it's filling the, the highest volumes oh, are oh, coming up yeah. right now. Um, but we're hoping that it will spill for a couple of weeks. We do have a tour arranged um, for our trustees, and if you would like to participate, uh, get in touch with me or call the district. Uh, we don't have unlimited space. It is open to everyone. If you would like to take your families out, uh, just follow Tom's directions. Uh, you don't need a specified tour or anything. Um, just go, go take a look because it is really uh, a great site. Uh, we don't Siri has a hard time because of some coverage. I don't know if Siri will be able to help you all the way, or she'll right, get you yeah. our way, or Just whoever the other people are. Just little directions, and, and they'll get you there. Um, it, like I say, if you're interested in coming with our group, uh, please call so that we can make those accommodations. If you'd like to come and take, bring your family, it's open any time uh, to do that. The flows are at their highest right now for the next few days. It will start to taper off. When we set the date for our board tour, we were just hoping. We have no idea when it's going to start, nor do we have a good idea when it's stopping. So we are hopeful that it's still... Um, It'll be, I'm guessing, at least 500 second feet by then. Yeah, it it's it's actually almost, some of the prettiest at right, lower flows it because it gets a more lacy, like curtainy look. Like place. It's, it's like yeah, right now it's just awe-inspiring and stuff like yeah. that. It's what day is that tour? That is a Tuesday. No, what day? July 2nd. July 2nd. Okay, July 2nd. Yeah, let them know. Mm -hmm. Chris is yes. inviting legislators and all sorts of people. Right. I will leave this jump drive that's got the little Central Utah symbol. It has that uh, entire presentation on it. You're welcome to use it. Um, we'll probably have it posted to the web, but I'll just leave that with you then. That's, that's all right.
September 19th day, yes. just, you know, the Utah Tourism Conference is going on okay. in Logan that date, so just there might be some people missing because of that. Perfect. Okay, thank so, you. That's a pretty major conference. Okay. We'll look and see that, how that's going to Okay. Thank you. Excellent. We will adjourn at this time. Thanks so much for coming. Have a great day. Thank you.